Okay. So, get that thing straightened up there. Let me share some statistics with you as we're getting started here tonight. <clears throat> this is just stuff I found scrolling through the internet, so I don't know how old it is, but it's probably pretty close to normal or right. The poverty rate in California is 12.3 statewide. Right? Poverty rate. Here in Purdue, it's 17.2%. But in Riverside, it's 17.6%. Anyone want to take a shot at Yukaipa? Yukaipa? No, 11% in Yukaipa, 23% in LA, and 22% in Santa Barbara. The city in California with the highest poverty rate, if I'm pronouncing it right, is Isla Vista. I S L A, Isla, 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 Isla Vista. It's right on the coast, um, like right, just west of Santa Barbara at 64%. Whoa. The median household income of Isla Vista is just $24,545 in California. It, it's also, there's a lot of uh, agriculture that goes on there, and I don't suspect they get paid a ton of money, but um, these are probably, you know, a few years old, so I'm sure that, um, in fact, I know they are. They're probably like, maybe almost five to 10 years old, these stats that I got right there. So more than likely those rates are probably a lot higher in our current economy. But to give you an idea of <clears throat> how tough it is all around, you know, financially for people and uh, for, for our state that, that should be doing way better in my opinion, anyway. Tonight we're gonna be uh, talking about something that kind of, you know, plays a little bit into that those specs right there and this is this is your opening question is there anything worse for a believer than spiritual bankruptcy anybody ever struggle with spiritual bankruptcy in here a couple of you probably more than um, <clears throat> maybe some don't even realize that that's really what's going on but we're going to try to kind of dig into it a little bit but to kind of preface the whole study tonight Spiritual bankruptcy can be um, summed up into this. It's Christianity without the Christ. That's hardcore, right? Yeah. Like, man, that's tough. So it's just a eonity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But we're going to dig in here because uh, I think there's some misconceptions about it. And not only are there misconceptions, but it's very fixable. Amen. Let's open a word of prayer and dive in. Father, thank you tonight for your word, Lord, and all that you have for us tonight. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us now for this very important stuff here, Lord, that we can all dig into and maybe uh, find some relief tonight. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. <clears throat> so before we, we dive too far into this thing, there's, there's a couple of things that uh, sound the same, spiritual bankruptcy and poor in the spirit. And they're, they're two very, very different things. And we don't want to confuse the two because one sucks and one does not. Amen? Bottom line there. I'll give you a couple of verses here. Spiritual bankruptcy versus pure and poor in spirit. So to be poor in spirit is to actually be content. I know that sounds weird, but remember, um, as, and we'll get to this, this verse, but Jesus actually said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So he's saying happier the poor in spirit. So to understand what poor in spirit is, we need to dig in a little bit deeper. Another thing is it's a poor in spirit is empty themselves of self-will, relies on God from a heart of purity, confesses in truth, turns away from whatever draws them away from God, refuses to look back for instant gratification from old habits like substance, money, food, relationships, totally relying on God for happiness and joy, open and responsive to the word and nothing to hide confident and secure that's the poor in spirit that's a good thing right all that thing is really good and it and it boils down to being humble humbling humble ourselves before the lord and not have any you know stuff between us and him and it opens up the word of god and it opens up all the blessings now on the spiritual bankrupt side never content 
lost the moral compass, make poor choices after poor choices, self-absorbed, oblivious to effects on others, spiritual giftedness, ministry, and life without love. Remember, remember uh, 1 Corinthians 13? If I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong, just a noisy symbol. Um, and feel separated from God and in prayer as well. And we feel like we're, we're, our prayers aren't going past the ceiling. Now, here's some signs that you might be getting low in your spiritual bank account right there. And, and you know what's interesting about this as I was digging through this thing? These all sound suspiciously like clinical depression as well, these uh, signs and symptoms. And I've had some experience in that. Anybody ever have... Uh, any clinical issues like that? I was told once, yeah, it's okay. People are like, I'm going to go and raise my hand. It's all right. You can raise your hand. You're welcome to humanity. Um, there was a time before Christ that I was actually, uh, strangely enough, diagnosed as a borderline schizophrenic, sociopathic with, sociopathic with, um, what the heck was the term they used? Um, antisocial behavior. Right? And I'm a pastor now, right? <laughs> schizophrenic. <laughs> schizophrenic. I don't agree with any of it, and neither do I. <laughs> Bunch of baloney. Lonely, depressed, angry, aggravated, and agitated. Anxiety, emotional, lost, and confused. Unable to study the Bible or understand sermons. Bored, unhappy, trouble making decisions. Prone to making bad choices fast, as in like a knee jerk decisions. Ooh, check out this one. Can't genuinely smile or laugh. Genuinely. You gotta force it. Things that used to bring you joy become hard to do. Spiritual bankruptcy. Again, a lot of this had, had uh, very similar symptoms to uh, clinical depression and things of that nature, which I don't doubt, man. I know it's there and it's real. But I also know that I've known people that were what you would, cons what you would consider to be you know, completely clinically depressed only to come back to God in a real um, authentic way and be able to just blast through all that stuff and find joy and happiness and fulfillment in their life yet again. Um, as, as children of God, the Holy Spirit indwelled within us, we don't do well separated from God. We just don't. And, and it's kind of a, it, kind of a catch-22 because as children of God walking in faith, we can walk through some pretty mighty fires, right? I mean, we walk through a lot of stuff and, and we can get through a lot of things uh, by the grace of God and, and others praying with us. And, and on, at the same token, on the other side of the sword, though, when we get separated from God, we are just this side of hopeless, almost. Life just comes to a screeching halt because we are now in a place where we can't go back to the things that we used to do, to, which we all know are all temporary and counterfeit anyway. But the things that we used to do to try to bring us those little um, glimmers of joy and happiness, you know, but they always seem to blow up in our faces, but we were okay with it because we just do something else that would bring us that little bit of temporary joy. But after coming to Christ, we found out where the eternal joy and happiness comes from, where the true strength in our life comes from. And so when we get separated from that, we become pretty miserable people based on all of that stuff that I found out there, right? So check out this, uh, the first fill in this. If you're dealing with this, all right, if you're there, then you already know what I'm talking about. If you're um, feeling like you're not sure, if, you know, what's going on, why does my life suck right now, why is everything upside down? Well, you know, sometimes God brings us to places that we have no choice but to bend a knee and come back to him. Amen. Sometimes we run in our own strength just as long as we possibly can. And, and the sucky part about it is we know what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing. So here's the first one. Face the hard facts. Face the hard facts. Let's see what the book, of God, let's see what the Word of God says about this sort of thing. 
It says here in Jeremiah, were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? No, they were not, they were not at all ashamed. Just whoosh, no big deal. Nor did they know how to blush. They, didn't, they weren't even, they didn't even uh, feel any kind of shame or regret or remorse at all. And it can get that bad to where we get so far away from God that um, what used to be a drag in the beginning where we feel like, man, this isn't cool. I'm really, you know, I know I'm breaking God's heart. I'm stepping outside of fellowship. I'm doing this and that to where our hearts get so hardened that it doesn't even leave a dent no more. They don't even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punishment, punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. There will be a, a reckoning. And, it, and it not, it's not necessarily because God's just so angry at you, but he loves us so much that sometimes, sometimes some of us require a good sound thumping before we can hear the pop of our head coming out of our hat. Amen? And it's a loud pop sometimes. Look at look what Titus says over here. Remember, this is facing the hard facts. If this is where you're at or this is where you're going or this is where you feel like you are moving in that direction, we don't need to keep going down that road, amen? Check it out. Check out what it says in Titus here. He says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their minds and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God... But in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. We just set ourselves on a whole horrible path off the narrow road, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse as time goes on. And again, we're not oblivious to this stuff. There comes a point where you may become oblivious, though. Maybe, maybe oblivious is not the right word. Maybe just completely uh, insensitive, I guess. Um, What's the right word I'm looking for here? Where you just, huh? Numb. Numb's a good word. You just become numb to it. Uh, but look at John. Look at First John over here with me, real quick. First John one. He goes like this, and we've we've read this uh, several times. But in this context, look what it says. This is the message which we heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's some brutal stuff right there. But but good stuff too. Because it gives us the, the A and B side of that record right there. It it's all about where we how far we get with the deception. And and I think maybe sometimes we think we can okie doke God and get away with this or that or whatever and have our little hidden secrets and stuff from him. But we all know that that's not true. That he he knows and sees and and his heart breaks over a lot of the things we do. But even worse about this spiritual bankrupt is just how dumb it makes us because we actually think we're fooling anybody around us, especially people that are close to us, um, that, that can read body language, you know. Um, just that awkward, funky feeling, you know, that something's up and it kind of puts everything on edge a little bit like that and that compounds everything as well it's it's way better just to get back just to come back get out of that nonsense whatever whatever the heck's going on bring it to the lord man because you know what nothing stays in the dark right eventually everything comes into the light one way or another it might be a week it might be a month it might be a year it might be five or ten years down the road and you might even have forgot what the heck it was way back then and the Lord brings these things into the light because he loves you and because we get too far away from him and, and furthermore we drag other people into the dark with us because misery amen So he gives us the ability to step right out of the darkness and into his marvelous light he is so cool that way and you're one prayer away incidentally if you're struggling with spiritual bankruptcy right now you're one prayer away from talking to him about it and getting on the right path 
Yeah, it does take some work, man. You know, we, we, we dig some pretty deep troughs in our life, man. We're, we're out there running amok and doing things like that. But you know what the cool thing is? God's willing to work with us as we work through all that stuff, to give us the strength that we need, to give us the courage that we need to go back. And sometimes you got to go tell people, I'm sorry, all right? Or sometimes you have to step away from something that you just be like, man, I don't even know if I can breathe if I'm not here or there. I assure you, man, there, there's nothing this world has to offer that God can't top a gajillion times over, amen? And furthermore, <laughs> choking out here, the crazy thing about this is, is that sometimes we hang on to the goofiest stuff when dad has the coolest thing right over there. If we could just get past being stuck on stupid. And then, boom, he reveals these things. You're like, man, what was I doing? So here's the second one. Come back for real this time. And I'm not going to send you that people aren't saved in here. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. But having an authentic relationship with Christ really truly means to be poor in the spirit. To turn your life over to God and his will, his decisions, his way. And they're always so much better than ours anyway. But sometimes it, there's a whole lot of lip service that goes into this stuff. And then if we're, not, if we're not willing to be obedient to him and we're not willing to, to walk in the way that he chooses for us to walk, which is always a better way, then the bank account starts dwindling down little by little by little. And the things that, that we find that'll, that fill our bank, our bank account, we're going to look at here in a second, but it has to do with like devotionals, um, authentic prayer. Not just, not just the lip service stuff, service to other people. You know, as soon as we get poor in the spirit, and I say there's a lot around here, it's not about us anymore. It's about other people around us. The spiritual bankruptcy flips that whole thing on the lid. And, and for all kinds of different reasons, all of a sudden it starts to be all about us. And it's really hard to walk in the kingdom of God when you're walking all about you and not all about him or the others around you. So look at Psalm 32, one of my favorite verses, as you all know in here. Save my life. He says here, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David speaking of those around him. When he would look and see joyful people, happy faces that were just motivating through life in the will of God, man, and they were truly joyful and blessed inside. Macarius happiness, that happiness that's way above explanation, man, and David's going, man, I wish I could be like that. Their transgressions are forgiven. Their sins, their, their evil plotting, you know, their, their sneaky planning and all that stuff, it, it's not they're not dealing with that because of the last part of this verse here that says, in whose spirit there is no deceit, because they came clean with God. They, they knew where they were stepping wrong. They knew that things needed to be changed in their life, and they made a conscious decision to go to the king of kings and say, look, Lord, I can't live like this anymore. I've, I've exhausted every lie that I can come up with now. I've exhausted every way that I can maneuver around you and around the people that I love, the people of my church, and it's exhausting, man. It's psychologically exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting. I'm just not happy. I can't find any joy anywhere, not even a, a, a drop of joy in my life. The things that I used to love to do, I can't even get myself up to go do those anymore. I'm just in this weird, gray, horrible place. And he says here, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. It is horrible to go through spiritual bankruptcy. It, it's absolutely horrible. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Consider that is what the word of God tells there. Take a look at that. Consider that. Does your, is your strength sapped out of you? You just don't have... And it's not necessarily strength like, you know, how strong you are in the arms. It's your intestinal fortitude, man, to to get up and do you, do you have to drag yourself out of the house to go to church or to go on a run or something like that or someone needs help with something like, oh, why me, man? It's just that, that joy and that passion that makes us move forward. Remember our honeymoon days when we first got saved, man? You couldn't keep us indoors for nothing. It was like being 
a kid in the 60s and 70s. As soon as it was light out, you know, we were down the road and we were gone. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. There's nothing, I have nothing left to hide from you, Lord. Not that he didn't know all that already, but there's something about coming to the Lord and going, look, this is where I am. This is where I've been. This is, I got no excuses before you here to tell you why. This is where I've slid to, Lord. And he says, and it says here, I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The guilt of it is removed. The, the things that, that in, and there's, there's like um, levels that we go through, you know, there's, there's shame and there's guilt, and then there's, um, um, what's the right word for this? It's, uh, it's uh, complacent where we just become complacent and, and eventually we become hard-hearted. Nothing, it doesn't even bother us anymore that we're totally just ditching God and all that he's done for us in our lives, all that he saved us from, all that he's saving us to, the blessings he's poured on our lives, the sanity that he's given us back, the joy that, that we never thought we would ever experience again. And we trade it in for trinkets, man, shiny things in our lives. Yet he's so faithful, even like if, if you know people do that to us, we just stick them in the eye with a yacht, man. Pow. Yeah. You can just go away. But God is so faithful and he loves us so deeply that even then he still draws us back to him. Look at uh, Psalm 69 with me real quick here. Check this out. Such a good psalm about coming back for real. And, and coming back for real is really important. All right? I know that we all sin and fall short of glory. God, don't, I'm not trying to imply that, that we're never going to make mistakes and things, but we do. But spiritual bankruptcy is a compilation of a lot of mistakes that we willingly go into. And we continue to dive into them deeper and deeper and deeper to the point that we don't even realize how excluded we are from the people around us anymore. We're so zeroed in on the opera ministry, the me, me, me thing, you know? He says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. And that's how it happens. It's kind of all of a sudden, out of the blue, man, everything just falls apart around you. It's like every little thing just starts falling apart. It seems like all at one time. And there's probably things that have been falling apart, but we have that ability and that in that mindset to just push things like, like kind of like we did back when we were on drugs. You know, I never had a problem paying bills when I was on drugs. <laughs> I never paid them. You know, in fact, I didn't have a drug problem when I was on drugs until I was out of drugs and it was a problem. And that's how that worked. And you just push stuff and you just push stuff, push stuff. We're getting evicted again. Ah, okay. Never really got the stuff out of storage from the last eviction. We've only been here for three months, but Go to the next place there. And you just squish stuff down and squish stuff down until at some point it all blows up in your face. And then you have what, what's sometimes referred to as hitting your bottom. Because there's nothing left. You have no egress in any direction to get out of something. You have to do something. And this is what's happening here when he's talking about this as a spiritual bankruptcy starts to overcome us. All of a sudden we realize the water's up to our neck. And our feet are stuck in mud. We can't even get out now. And the water's still rising. It's getting to be hopeless. This is really bad. And it says here in verse 3, I'm weary with my crying. My throat is dry. And my eyes fail while I wait for my God. For what? What are you waiting for? Him to come and rescue you? Well, sure. God, God rescues us all the time. I mean, he does a lot of things that he, he read. But check it out. If we're, if we're going to continue just to keep playing games with God, he will allow things to come into our lives and, and really get our attention. And you can get mad at him even, even when we're in that place. And again, back to the self-absorption thing, being all about me and all that stuff. How can you let me get to this place in my life? How can you let me get to this place in my life? And, and that's the thought process. Blaming God for our life. Blaming God that we've been absolutely disobedient and blaming God that we've, we've allowed our, 
our walk with him to deteriorate, blaming God that we've traded all of his love and glory and mercy and grace for some stupid thing that we know is not going to last. But we're willing to do that for that little bit of excitement. And then all of a sudden we're here at the end. Now we're screaming and we're crying out to the Lord and getting all, all teary-eyed because he hasn't showed up yet. But did we ever stop to think that maybe we were never really authentic with him when we called out for help? Or was it just another 911 call, like at the, the last room at the county jail? When they do warrant checks and stuff like that, everybody's religious in that room, man. Everybody's praying that their name don't come up, man. And they're praying, so I'm going to be on their knees and everything praying. Their name don't come up, and that door opens up, man. Their faith stays in that room right there. And they just hit the ground running right back into the same old mess that they found themselves in that got them there. But on the other hand, when we finally break down to him, and we truly go, Lord, I just can't live like this anymore. You know, it, it's, not, it's not working out. For me, it's not working out for you. It's not working out for people around me. Look over here at uh, Psalm 40 with me right quick it says here do not withhold your tender mercies from me O Lord let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me for innumerable, e for innumerable evils have, uh, have surrounded me my iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up there are more than the hairs of my head therefore my heart fails me this is a confession to the Lord look I know I've blown it I've blown it so big, I can't even count them anymore. I've lost track of the lies I've had to tell to cover the first lie that I started with. And then you've got to tell 10 more to cover that one. Then you've got to tell 10 more to cover those 10. And before long, all of a sudden, you're starting to find out that you're, you're, li you're, you're getting yourself all tripped up on stuff. Because your lies aren't making sense anymore. They're not lining up. It's impossible to do that, man. It's impossible to keep some ridiculous thing hidden and secret forever. It's, it's not possible this side of heaven, and you won't have to worry about it on that side. <laughs> Amen? So this is, this is, a, this is a heartfelt confession to, to the Lord. Don't, please, don't hold your tender mercies from me. All your loving kindness. This is, this, is what, this is us going back to him going, look, your mercy, your tender mercies, your loving kindness, your truth, they preserve me. This is the stuff that I'm starving for. I'm dying in this wilderness that I've created for myself. I'm drowning in this river of ignorance. And then it comes down to verse 13. It says, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste. Help me. This is coming back to him for real. Now, I would like to think that, that this kind of a prayer that we, that we call on our Father with is genuine from the heart and not just more lip service of the Lord but he'll know that too by the way but the more important thing is will you know it will you be able to discern the difference between just another game you're running on God or if this is really the time that you're like Lord this is where it stops this is where my walk begins maybe you've been saved for 20 or 30 years you know welcome to the human race it's okay He'll know because verse 13 shares that with us when it says, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Because he is pleased to deliver us from that madness. It does please him. It brings him great joy to see his children come out of that madness that we get ourselves all trapped in, man. There's, there's nothing joyful for the Lord to see his children stuck on stupid any more than, any of, than it is for any of us to see our children or our grandchildren just running amok. We want to help them out. For my mom, for instance, you know, she helped me out of a lot of situations like that. Didn't do me any good at all. Because I called on the same stuff with her, you know, and I begged and pleaded and cried and threw my, grand, threw my children in front of her. That was always a good one for, for moms. You know, throw the babies out there and get some sympathy, you know, that way. And, and the crazy thing is, she did a lot of things for me for my children not for me if the children weren't there I might have rotted in jail actually she never bailed me out of jail once as a matter of fact but I never asked her to but in this situation 
We can come back tonight, this very night. You know, if you're struggling through stuff like that, there's no reason why you have to live another second like that. Not in the kingdom of God. Not serving God Almighty. That's not the God that we serve. He's not, he's not a vengeful, mean-spirited, hating God. He loves us beyond our, our understanding how much He loves us. And He's so willing to dive in there and pull us out of that muck and mire and knock all the junk off. But you know what? If we're, if we're just going to keep playing games with him like that, I promise you, though, the next time the river will be deeper and the mud will be stickier. And it might not work out as well the next time around. But check this out. Give, give Jesus your whole heart again. Give Jesus your whole heart again assuming that you didn't quite do that the first time around. Maybe you didn't understand. Maybe you didn't really realize just how involved this thing called a relationship with Jesus Christ really is. That it really meant that we're, when we say, look, I give you my life, Lord, that it meant like our whole life, you know, and not just the showing up to church part of our life or whatever benefits we get out of being Christians or uh, the friends that we make and things of that nature. That's all great, and it's all super cool. But before anything happens, our lives are dedicated to Jesus Christ. When we receive him into our hearts, we confess our sin. We ask him to be the Lord and Savior of our life, and we're indwelled with his Holy Spirit. That is a lifetime commitment, man. Not like putting a patch on your back and deciding after a while you don't want to play no more. And you peel that thing off. When we give our life to Christ, everything changes in our life. And everything has changed. I'm sure that most of you can agree with me that life before Christ was no cup of tea, man. It was some difficult stuff. Not that this life hasn't had its ups and downs, but by far, walking, walking with Christ, we can sure sustain a lot more damage than we did back in the old days, right? And we, we navigate things differently now than we did back then. We navigate them through the blood of Christ and through the, looking, at, looking at things through the, through the lens of Christ as opposed to all the ridiculous, stupid stuff we did back in those days and the decisions that we made that were really dumb. If you think back on some of the decisions that we made you know, before Christ, they were just dumb, man. But we didn't give them any thought. You know, and, and more often than not, they were desperation. We had to make a quick decision right now, and it generally wasn't the best thing to do, right? Real quick, make up your mind. Do I put my hands up or do I run? Some of us ran. Not a good idea. You know, one thing I learned a long time ago is that cop dogs are way faster than me. <laughs> way faster. And they mean business, too. It's almost like they like their job, you know? I learned a long time ago, too, that um, when a cop pulls you over, you know what the best thing to do is? Pull over, man. You know, you, you, and I've had some pretty fast cars and pretty fast bikes, but I ain't never been able to ride faster than a cop radio. They're super fast, man. It's almost like they know where you're going to be before you get there. It's like supernatural or something, man. But see, that was the mindset before Christ, the insanity that we lived in. And whether you lived that life or not, anything outside of Christ is still a form of insanity, man. Now that we know what we know, the goodness, we've tasted the goodness of Christ, man. What can we ever go back to? Why? How could we ever go back to that? We know too much now. We know too much to go back and pretend. I am woman, hear me roar. Okay, that was weird, but... It's part of the song. Elizabeth's like, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> okay, well, that, you had a mom look right now. Freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> I'm moving on. I'll do my own move on right now. Give Jesus your whole heart again. Look at Matt. Now look at Matthew 5 with me. Check this out. Jesus' words, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right now. It's the kingdom of heaven, here and now, and certainly eternally as well. But sometimes that gets overlooked right there. Sometimes it gets like, well, blessed are the poor in spirit, and one day, you know, the kingdom of heaven will be yours. Let me share something with you, man. When you've given your life to Christ authentically and genuinely, 
the kingdom of heaven is yours. You're there. It's a done deal. He, he paid that price for you to be there, for all of us to be there. When we, when we enter into this relationship with Christ and, and we're saved by him, the kingdom of heaven is ours. So between here and there, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what are we going to do with the kingdom of heaven between here and eternity? Between now and rapture or between now and when God calls us home? Are we going to squander it? Or are we going to live it to the max? And everything that this word has for us here in this kingdom of heaven, everything that Jesus says is ours is ours. You know why I know that? Because Jesus never lies. If he says this is going to happen, you know what you can count on? It's going to happen. And if it's not going to, it's not going to as well. But if he tells us right now that blessed, blessed, are, the, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's telling us we can be happy beyond our, our, our conception of happiness. This, is, this word blessed is makarios in the Greek. It means to be, the, it's, it's an, an exceptional, over-the-top happiness. Not like goofy, like, you know, you took a bunch of mushrooms or something like that. It's it's in the spirit, man, deep in your soul, a happiness that can sustain you through really tough times. It can, it, it's a joy, and it's powerful, and it's mature, and, and it's contagious. It can, it can go out from you as well. It can, be, it can be helpful to people that are struggling and going through difficult times. This, this bless that he's talking about here, this is something that gets us through these difficult times. It may not be fun. It's still going to be difficult and challenging and stuff like that. But where are you going to find anywhere in the Bible that says, you know, thus says the Lord, now that you're saved, you're never going to have a bad day again in your life. You ain't going to see that in there, man. But you can't have a blessed day in a bad day. That's the power of Jesus Christ, you guys. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. But that poor in the spirit, remember, being content. Being content in where you are, what you have, who you are, the people that you associate with, your family, your jobs, things like that. There, there's a real problem in America with discontentment. People want more and more and more and more and more. And then they get it, you know what? They attain whatever it is they want. And you know what they want? More. They're insatiable. It, and, and the Bible talks about, about heathens and pagans being this way that, that they chase after all these things, man, and once they get to them, lo and behold, it's not really doing it for them. Maybe, maybe a year ago, that's, they got to have it, and that's going to be, that's going to bring me happiness right there. If I just get that bike, or that gun, or that guitar, or that person, man, I will be happy for the rest of my life. How many times have we achieved those goals only to find out that they were shallow and empty? They didn't bring what we thought they were going to bring. God already knew that, man. Em emptying themselves of self-will, that's where it all starts. Not my, not my will, but your will be done is what we talk about in the Word of God, right? But it flips around, not your will, but my will be done. <clears throat> that's what we're saying to God. I know you don't want to admit it, and that's cool. You, know, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But when we do what we're talking about here, we're telling God, not your will, but my will. I mean, I'll throw some of your will in there if it fits into my will. But no one's, gonna, no one's sure that it will fit into my will or your will or my will. <laughs> will it? <laughs> what? How about this one? The confusion. Confusion and um, inability to make decisions. In, in the goofiest stuff where, you know, it, it, it's typically, you know, we have pretty sound minds and things like that. Then all of a sudden you get into this place where you can't even make the simplest of decisions. And when you do, it's not a rational decision that you worked out and, and maybe did any research on. You just kind of end up going, okay, you know what, whatever, I'll just do that right there. And nine times out of ten, you're going to be wrong. And, and most of the time you already know it because you're just... It's kind of like throwing darts at a dartboard and whatever, wherever it lands, that's where, okay, I guess that's where we're going to go because that's my will and God's will. I have a way better will than that, actually. I have a big plan for you. But check this out over in John 16 now. Is it John 16? Is that where I'm going? Okay, hold on. Let's see. 
Oh, most certainly is, John 16. Jesus speaking, and he said, Jesus answered him, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, and has come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. Do you believe it now? Do you believe that, that we can separate ourselves from God? We can separate ourselves from God. Remember, God's word says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's God's promise to us. So if there's a separation going on there, we've got to point the fingers back at ourselves here. We're the ones that create that separation. But even though Jesus was going to be on a cross and all of his inner circle, the disciples were going to take off running, which they did. He told them right then and there, look, even though that's all going to happen, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to be alone on that cross, man. He says, yet I am not alone because my Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, this is what he's, what he's going to explain now. These things I have spoken to you that in me you, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So these things that are coming at you and these things that you're struggling with right now, first of all, expect them. Bad things are going to happen this side of heaven. Amen. The world is an ugly place. It's a great big sin factory. It's a mess. But we're not of this world. But when we get caught up in that stuff, it's like a sticky, gooey tar that gets on us to the point where it starts to hold us to where we can't even move anymore if we, if we dabble in there for too dang long. And he's going, look, all this stuff, be of good cheer. Be happy. Be Macario happy. I've overcome this stuff. So whatever comes at us, we already know that Jesus is overcoming. Now, whether it was like a, a, a thing that you're dealing with right now, maybe a mortgage or, or some kind of credit cards or money, financial stuff like that, be of good cheer that Jesus already has that figured out too for you. He's already overcome this stuff. What this means to say is in your life, in my life, he's already overcome these things. All we need to do is show up with him, man. All we need to do is just say, Lord, I know you're here. This is really sucking right now. There's stuff coming at me. But here's the crazy thing about anything that's going on in our lives. He, al he always has uh, an ulterior plan going on outside of your thing that's right in front of your face. There's always some blessing on the other side. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's for Crusher or somebody else. But, but by, by Elizabeth being blessed by something that you're going through, you will in turn be blessed because she's been blessed. That's the whole poor in the spirit thing. Her joy and happiness builds our joy and happiness. And all of a sudden, whatever we were whining about back there and sniveling and crying isn't really that big of a deal after all. But when we look at stuff through the binoculars of Satan, everything looks bigger. And, and after a while, we put away the binoculars and start busting out with telescopes, man. And look through the enemy's thing, man. Everything's even bigger and bigger. And before long, man, we're on like a Hubble telescope that we're looking at. Something that Jesus looks at and goes, you're tripping out over that right there? Man, I just flick that thing away just like that. What are you getting so uptight and freaked out about? Well, because everywhere I look, I just have mountains all around me. And he's like, yeah, but... I'm here with you in this valley. What are you flipping out about, man? Let's walk that way. And that's just, I know, oversimplistic, but that's just the truth, man. So look at Matthew here, Matthew 6. It, it, it definitely is, is moving in the right direction for us to give our life back to Christ. Look what he says here in Matthew 6. He goes, therefore, do not worry. I love that verse right there. First of all, because Jesus said it. Okay, so if Jesus says to do something or if Jesus says don't do something, would you consider that a command? I do. All right. If he says don't bang your head against the rock, I'm with that one for him. You know, I'm like, Lord, I'm going to obey that command right there. I'm not going to bang my head against that rock right there. It's the ones that don't agree with that get me in trouble. But this one, he says, therefore... Do not worry. So if Jesus says, do not worry, what do you think we ought to do? Probably not worry. Now, I'm not talking about being an idiot here, all right? Walk in front of that bus, don't worry. That's just <laughs> dumb, all right? And you deserve whatever happens to you, man. If you're a bug on the windshield of that truck, you're going to arrive in heaven that way. And you might just spend all eternity like that. 
Okay? No, I'm kidding. I made that part up right there. But certainly someone's going to go, what the heck were you thinking? Well, Jesus said, don't worry. <laughs> he says, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? We worry about the goofiest stuff sometimes, man. What are they going to think about us? What are they going to say about us? When they look at us, are they, like, saying mean things about us? You know, I did a study once on worry, and it was a long one, too, man. And it was, like, uh, all the things that we worry about. You know, it's a percentage thing, like the other thing was there. You know, all the things we worry about, you know, 100% of this, 80%, blah, blah. I went all the way down to the, the things that we worry about that, can, that might actually happen are, like, something like 2% or something like that. Of, of the 100% of stuff that we worry about that will ever come to pass. And of that 2%, it was like some crazy, like 0. .00 something of things that actually do come to pass. You know, we spend so much time worrying about stuff. And, and if we take that time that we worry about stuff, and if we would convert that into time that we spend in the Word of God, or in prayer, or in service to the kingdom... How much better might our lives be, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, if we just would chill the heck out, man? But look what he says here. <clears throat> after all these things, what do we drink? What do we wear? What are we going to eat? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. It's not a big surprise to him that Crusher doesn't know what to wear to church tonight. He's already got the shirt picked out that he wants him to wear or the hat for that chap in the cap. <laughs> but there's a catch to this. There's a catch to this, this joy, this uh, contentment here, this, this uh, feeling good and safe and secure. Here's the catch. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Start there. Start with God. Just start with him. And all these things will be added to you. And more, actually. But once we get off the me, me, me thing, get off ourself a little bit, and go, Lord, what will you have me do today? Who can I go minister to? Who can I talk to? How do you want me to pray? Show me something in your word, Lord, something really cool that I've never seen before. Break it down for me, Lord. And then, you know, whatever your will is, let's get going with it today. If you want me to take off over that way, I'm going to take off that way. If you want to take off that way, I'm going to take off that way. And we're not even tripping on what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, none of that stuff. It's all about putting his kingdom first and these things being added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Check this out. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. we got enough going on right now, don't you think? Especially if we're, if we're our spiritual bank account is in subs and stuff like that, we're all, our brains are already going a million miles an hour in all kinds of different directions, stuff like that. And he's like, and so what are you tripping about what you're going to be doing tomorrow or the next day or the next week or something like that? We got stuff we need to work on right now, today. And, and the cool thing about God is he'll work on any of this right now, not just today, but tonight, this moment. Any moment that you choose, man, he's ready for all of us to come before him and go, hey, Lord, I am exhausted. I can't do this anymore. I've, I've been just running and running and you know what? I've run and run and run like Forrest Gump. I've run and run and run. And the one thing that I've realized, the one constant in all of this running is I haven't moved from this spot. I've been in the same spot, Lord, just like running in little teeny circles like a dog chasing my tail. I know it. You know it. Everybody around me knows it, Lord. Help me. Then go back to that psalm. Help me, Lord. Okay, so here's where, here's where we wrap it up tonight in this amazing psalm over here. Psalm 61. Check this out. Huh? Okay, whatever. Yeah, I did that on purpose. I have, I have a helper, but my helpy helper's not helping. But you get in there. You got it. Give him a hand. Chris, is, Chris has a new job to keep me on track. What is it? But I only have A, B, and C. Oh, well, then you can't help me tonight. 
And we didn't work out the wrong book either. It's a process, amen? So we've read this thing several times too, but now we're, we're looking at it in a different context of coming to Jesus with our whole heart and how we can help each other get there. It says here, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He ain't gonna, it, you're not going to feel that spiritually bankrupt. You're not going to feel the spirit of God on you. You're going to feel like he is in a gajillion, billion, trillion miles away from you. He doesn't hear your voice anymore. He doesn't hear your prayers. You can't feel him in your spirit. You can't feel him in your heart. And that's just not true. That's just us, all right? God has never left us, ever. He's always with us. It's what we do to separate ourselves from him. So the spirit of the, uh, the, spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. And this isn't the poor in spirit here. This is the poor spiritually, not the poor in spirit. So that we understand what we're talking about here. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives, those that have been imprisoned by the spiritual bankruptcy, that are brokenhearted. Their hearts are broken. They're, I don't think there's anything, I mean, we could be brokenhearted over breaking up with somebody or something like that, but there's nothing, like, uh, there's nothing that feels like being separated from God. You really feel a broken heart on that one right there. If, if you have an authentic relationship with Christ, to be separated from him is the worst of the broken heart. It's a spiritual broken heart. And he says here to proclaim the liberty to the captives. You don't have to live like this anymore. I'm promising you that. You don't have to. And the opening of prisons to those who are bound, that have been chained down to whatever the heck it is that's keeping them separated from God or multitude of things that's kept them separated from God. You don't have to be chained down anymore because we serve an awesome, mighty merciful, loving, joyful, powerful God that says, no, there's not a chain made that I can't break. Then he goes to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Hey, I'll proclaim it. Today's the day. This is the year to get out of that prison once and for all. You don't need to stay there for one more minute. To give them beauty for ashes and the joy of oil for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Enough with all the burned down life, the crying, the heaviness that goes along with all of this stuff. Man, he's going, look, you are trees of righteousness. You have no business being all rolled up on the ground there in a ball, man. That isn't why Jesus died for us, to let the world just defeat us and beat us down. To let anything that comes down the pike, you're like, okay, I give up, I, I'm done, you win, whatever. Come on, we're, we're warriors, man. We're more than conquerors. When did we get all of a sudden all wimpy, man? This is not what God called us to be. He called us to be trees that he can be glorified in. That the, the world can look at us and go, man, there's really some stuff going on in that person's life, but look at, they're still standing straight. And they're tall and they're smiling. And they're still worshiping their God and they're singing psalms. How is that possible? Like I've said a million times, read the book Jesus Freaks, Voice of the Martyrs. And you'll see these martyrs that stood tall in the face of persecution and even death, man. And horrible death. And people were astounded. Like, how can they be singing psalms to the Lord while their body is on fire? I don't get that, man. And then people's lives were changed and dedications were made and people got saved. They said, well, I don't know. Whatever that is, I want a whole bunch of that right there. And sure enough, people started getting saved and then they probably got lit on fire too. But praise the Lord. Here's the last part of this though that I love right here because this is what happens on the other side of what I'm talking about here. On the other side of spiritual bankruptcy when we finally decide to stop playing games with God and, and stop letting the world beat us down and use us as their personal punching bag. It says, and they shall rebuild old ruins. Old ruins of what? The old, old ruins of you and what you were before you got twisted up in all this stuff. When you were a pillar, man, and people looked up to you and said, man, 
that's a whole, that's a person right there that knows Jesus Christ, man. I got something going on in my life. I need to talk to him. I need to talk to her. I need to get some prayer. Those are the ruins I'm talking about. They're still there. All right, they're not gone. We just need to rebuild them. It says they shall rise up the former desolations too. Those things that we walked away from. Maybe it was ministry stuff. Maybe it was people that you, that were, that you were ministering to. Whatever, whatever these desolations are, they're all still there too. They're not gone. They're right there. And he says, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. It might have been a long time ago. Much time has passed. But you know what's cool with God? A day to God is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. It don't mean nothing to him, man. All that means to him is our heart coming back to him genuinely. So here's the application tonight. I know there are spiritually broke folks here tonight. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. There's people that are really struggling right now. You may not know it because they can fake their smiles really well. Got good at it. Maybe they practice in the mirror. I don't know. But you know what? You know what is a dead giveaway is the eyes, man. It's hard to hide what's in the eyes, amen? So I know there's people that are broke here tonight. I get it, and I'm not beating you up or nothing. In fact, I'm trying to be that person that uh, can help proclaim liberty for you tonight. You don't got to live like that anymore. Is, is all your problem racks going to go away tonight? Nope. They're not, but you're going to see them in a totally different way. I promise you that. You see them through the lens of Christ. And, and a lot of the stuff that you're hanging on to, that you're dealing with right now, you're going to go in there like with a chainsaw. You're going to start chopping stuff off that really doesn't matter that much. But it's just sticking to you, man, like sticky tar, glue, feather, stuff like that. And all of a sudden, Jesus is going to reveal some stuff to you. And you're like, what am I tripping on that for, man? I don't even drink Fanta anymore. That was random, wasn't it? Okay. Well, we're in a 60s vibe, so I'm... Whoop. It says here in the application, you don't have to be. Come back to Jesus tonight. Just come back already. Enough. You spend enough time groveling, being on the ground, and wimping out. That's just not... It's not a good look, man. You don't wear it well anymore. Maybe it worked for you 20 or 30 years ago, but it ain't working now. Amen. You're children of the Most High God. We need to act like it and come back home. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. And I do believe that there's some folks struggling tonight, Lord. I mean, they're struggling all over the world right now, Father. But right now, I'm interested in the ones that are right here in this room tonight, Father. And, and we have some that aren't even here tonight that I know are struggling with that stuff. And we lift them up in prayer as well. But tonight, for those that are here, Lord... If your word sunk in anywhere, Lord, and there's stuff that's going on, then, Father, I pray that tonight your Holy Spirit can really just break through that tough exterior of that heart, Father, that's, that's become like a stony heart, it's become hard, Lord. Man, the power of your Holy Spirit can bust through anything. There's nothing that your Holy Spirit can't get through. So tonight, I ask that you, that you do break through this, Father, that they... All of us here tonight, Father, can just lay our troubles at your throne, Father. Your word says that we can cast them on your throne because you care for us, Lord. Father, I pray that tonight hearts are receptive to your care for us, that we don't have to live like this anymore. We can step out of this place tonight very different than the way we walked in that door. And so, Lord, I ask that you have your way in love, that you have your will, Father. Anything that you have for us, Lord, we receive it tonight in Jesus' name. Let's all pray together as a family. Amen. Father God, I've sinned against you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart again to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and put me on that road that you'll have me travel and help me stay there. In Jesus' name, amen? Let's give the Lord some praise. He's so awesome. I hope you guys found something in there tonight, because I know I did, and the Lord's got big plans. We just need to get out of his way, <laughs> amen? There's going to be girls praying over there. There's going to be guys praying over there, and I'm certain that there's people in here that need prayer. If you don't come and get some prayer, you're going to be a prayer. square, amen? And I will see you guys uh, Tuesday for another installment of First Corinthians. 
We only got a couple more, about a chapter and a half to go, and we're moving on to something else. Amen? Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys. Amen.